There we go. All right, so now we'll go on. Watch, I'll connect it to you. Andy, what's going on? Not much. How you doing, Gene? First time. I didn't know we could even do this. <laughs> I just I just learned about it a week ago, and now we're doing these all the time. <laughs> awesome. No, it's cool. Yeah. Oppor opportunities, right? Anytime there's adversity, there's always some kind of opportunity. Oh, yeah. Trust me. I figured that out, this whole virus situation. Yeah. What have you been up to? Uh, well, I, I, so right before everything started, I, I moved to Boston. And uh, I started working for Spartan Race. And uh, so the owner, uh, founder, Joe DeSena, brought me out to Boston. Um, well, I went out to Boston to teach him and his kids my base wrestling system. And uh, he was looking for a wrestling coach for his kids. I was looking for a platform for base. We came to an agreement that I would coach his kids and he would host my, plat and he would host my training system on his platform. So um, we're, we're starting Spartan Combat. Um, so it's going to be another umbrella under the Spartan, uh, another branch or whatever under the Spartan umbrella. So you have Spartan and then Spartan Race, Spartan Combat. And, uh, you know, right now Spartan Combat is just some apparel, um, but we're going to do apparel. Uh, then I'm going to have the base training system on there. Um, I'm going to have the, the base wrestling and then also base movement, which is the physical literacy to use in the wrestling room. And then we're going to co-sponsor some events with New Way um for uh wrestling and jujitsu and then uh and then we'll move into some other things we already started a podcast um with uh ryan warner he's going to do the spartan wrestling podcast uh and then he's he's going to start his own podcast with them he's, he's going to do spartan change my life um yeah. to mirror his wrestling change my life one and then eventually we'll get into some other media some other types of equipment sales and stuff like that so Awesome. So yeah, so we're starting a whole wrestling factory and combat sport factory of jujitsu, wrestling, and anything fight related. Eventually, oh, that's great. Really, yeah. Cool. So, yeah, but during this time, I since we don't have much, people can't train wrestling. Um, so I, I was like, hey, you know, we could go live with the base movement class. And so today we filmed the eleventh video. But we have a two-week uh, class for kids on the Spartan Facebook and YouTube channel. And all it is is a 30-minute class to get the kids moving. And so it's the base method. So it's battle athletics, go exercise. And so every practice uh, or class, you want to call it, they, um, they do some stuff where they're doing a battle with themselves. So today we did mountain climbers, three sets of 30. Um, we worked on a skill. And so we did headstands. Um, and then the athletic, we did the warm up to do the movement. So we started with a whole bunch of stuff to get the kids just moving and going and having fun. That's awesome. Yeah. So great we're getting team. great engagement on it. It's been super fun. Yeah. My, my brother noticed it first, the base class that you were teaching it. So what are some examples of that? He told me about it and he was loving it. You know, my brother, Jeff, who's my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so, uh, so we had to modify this because this class is meant for, um, a wrestling room, and so we use the base method. We use, sorry, we use the base method to. That's the improvements. But what do you want to improve? And so we want to improve our strength, flexibility, mobility, balance, and movement. And so, in order to do so, we want to have some consistency. And so, the consistent part of this class is the first 15 minutes we do the base wrestling warm up which is modified for to be able to do it in place, right? So we do a running circuit, then we do a dynamic stretch routine. And so that takes up the first 15 minutes. From there, now that we're warmed up, then we go into the skill, right? So that it's an athletic warm up, dynamic stretch, you know, running. Then we go into the skill based part. And so now we spend five minutes on working on a skill. Usually in the wrestling room, it would be more gymnastics based skill. But since we can't have that, we altered it to do um, more of a balancing skill, right? And so um, two of the days we work on inverted balances and then two of the days we work on balance skills on one foot, right? So we do headstands, uh, we do crow pose for this 14 days. So we want to be consistent with the skills. And then we do half moon and then dancers pose on one foot. 
And so we, we give the kids some time to work on it, improve their balance, um, give them some, some tips and pointers. And then we go into a circuit, right? The circuit is athletic. And so it's meant to build our upper body, our core and our legs. And so we have two different circuits that we rotate between. And then the last part is the battle. And so we have four different battles. And so we go two classes just like that. And then we have a cross training class, which is more of a yoga type class. Um, I did like a yoga class for the first couple, but it's hard for kids who don't do yoga to follow. And so I altered it. And so I just made it more of a simple routine. So we do three yoga routines. So it's like real easy, um, like four or five movements. And we just run them through, run them through. And so we do them for, for about four minutes and we do the next one, run them through, run them through four minutes. So, so that way they're not like constantly thinking they're just repeating the same movements. And so they're just learning how to do certain skills, certain movements, um, get their body in different positions. And, uh, you know, we've been having great success. I think we're averaging around 35,000 views per class. Wow. Yeah, and so we're gonna re-up, do it again for another 14 days. Yeah. Change it up, you know, do different circuits. We'll have different skills we work on. Do you have demographics of the kids, like what ages they are, or is it? That well, I mean, specifically, the class was made for eight and under, but you know, there's people that we know that are doing this class that are like, you know, even high school kids, right? Some parents are doing it with their kids, you know, it's, I mean, it could be for anybody, right? Like, yeah, you know, and um, you know, and this is you know, it, well, you made it for kids, but maybe more high school, even college people are using it. I don't know, yeah, yeah, I mean, um. I mean, it's simple, you know, it's not, it's not meant to be hard. And that's the philosophy of my wrestling training is like, I don't want to train the 1%. I want to train the average, but I want to give the 1% room to grow. And that's when you give them their opportunity to go do things on their own. Right. So being a mindset coach and, and, um, you know, this is a mindset, the wrestling mindset page, um, so you'll appreciate it, right? So every single day we start with the base pledge, which is they have to promise to learn one thing, to leave better than they started, help somebody else do the same, and then have fun doing it, right? So that's mind. Um, so learning is the mind. Body is improving physically. Helping is like for the spirit, right? When you give back to others, you feel good about yourself. And then having fun is the soul, right? Mind, body, spirit, soul. Because if you're not enjoying it, you know, you don't have that spirit, right, so to say. Um, and so so we want them to be able to give back, to help. And, you know, obviously myself and the kids that I'm doing it with, we're giving back to the audience, the people watching. We hope that they share with their friends and family because we want them to inspire others to lead a happier and healthier life. Yeah. No, it sounds a lot like what we do with the mindset principles with our teams before and after every one of the workouts. We have them go through the four mindset principles. I'm thankful for the opportunity to wrestle. I'm aggressive and relentless. I have no fear of losing or making mistakes. I never, ever give up. So they get those verbal affirmations. Right. Team speaking the same language. You're saying it out loud. So sometimes your mouth teaches your mind and your heart. Oh, for sure. No, and I agree. Because, I mean, that's, we do the same thing. We have them say it in the beginning. And at the end, I asked the two kids, you know, what they learned, what they got better at. And obviously for us, you know, it's not like wrestling where you could go help, you know, you're not in the room, you know, for us, we're helping people to, you know, inspire them by doing the workout. And, and then obviously the enjoyment, that is a mindset, right? Of like, hey, you, you have two options in life if you want to do something, you know, and it's not always easy for these kids, right? Like we walk them out and every single day and a couple of them enjoy it, right? Because they're like, hey, I got to do it. There's no questions, right? This is what we do as a family. We walk up the mountain. And, um, you know, but there's a couple at different ages that they just think it's miserable, right? And so their mindset and the whole time they're going up and they hate it. And it's like, well, you have two options. You can either enjoy what you're doing and just do it, or you can fight back and be miserable, but everything in your life is gonna end up being miserable, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. We have, a, we have a whole lesson dedicated to that, that whenever you catch yourself complaining, right away, you give three, to, you give three uh, things you're thankful for. Right? right, And the reason why we start with gratitude, I'm thankful for the opportunity, is because you can't be, it's like you can't be nervous or you can't be upset and at the same time they clash. Oh, for, no, absolutely, right? You know, because, I mean, we're in an unbelievable, grateful situation. We're in a farm in Vermont 
there's yeah. fresh air. We have a mountain in our backyard. Um, there's a cabin on top that I'm once it's clear, I'm going to go camp out there and start stargaze at night. Um, you know, so it could be worse, right? We could be stuck in an inner city. You know, we could be in a small apartment in New York. We could be in the Corona capital of the world right here, New York City. Yeah, right? Like, you know, and so, I, you know, I'm forever grateful to be in a situation I'm in. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to help the kids understand, like, you know, you guys are in a great, great situation. And, uh, and so, you know, it's a battle, but, you know, lessons aren't learned overnight. And, you know, there's different age kids here. So they're all at different levels of understanding of this world and how they fit in. And, you know, you always go through a defiant stage of like, hey, I'm going to test the limits. And it's like, you know, today we've had to stop them a few times and be like, look, like, when you guys go work in life, you know, if, you, if somebody tells you to go do something, and then you go do something else, and you're not doing what you're told, and then you don't get the job done, then people have to start micromanaging you and overlook it. And I said, but if you guys just do what you're told, and just do it well, then you're going to have freedom. People are going to trust that you get the work done. They're not going to have to come check with you, you know, which is I'm grateful for, right? Like Joe DeSanta, he's like, hey, you want to do this? Go do it. Like, I trust you're going to get this done, right? And so he doesn't have to come and be like, hey, you ready to film today? Like, what are you going to do? Like, he's like, oh, you're, you're doing a good job. You, you have everything ready. You're organized. And so, uh, so that's one of the biggest lessons that you want to instill on the kids. It's like, get your job done and then you have endless possibilities of to do what you want in the future. Right. And so we always say the big picture, keeping the eye on the big picture, which is using wrestling or whatever it is, whether it's Spartan, whether it's wrestling, whatever it is, as a vehicle to build virtue. Because if you become virtuous, this is what you're saying, really. If you're virtuous, you'll be good at anything you do. Your, you know, your family life, um, you know, friends, school, business, you name it, you'll be good at it because you've built virtue. If all you're striving for is success on the mat, you might be successful on the mat, but you don't, you don't get that virtue. Like too many fat coaches, right? Too many, yeah. people, too many, too many, um, you know, bad marriages and everything. And it's, and again, I'm not saying it's always a person's fault, right? There's always circumstances, but as wrestlers, where it's such a holistic sport, we should have developed, if our aim was on virtue, we could be great across the board. Right. So. Right. Well, I mean, that just goes back to kind of like, you know, for me, you know, if you want to relate it to life like that, you know, that goes back to um, the five things that I believe you could control in life, right? And, and a lot of people will argue like what you can and can't control. But I think that I learned some lessons in wrestling of like, hey, the five things in wrestling that you could control, the first thing you could control is yourself. And so that's your strength, flexibility, mobility, balance, and movement, right? So be the ultimate athlete. You don't have to be the strongest. You don't have to be the most flexible and mobile. You don't have to have the best balance. You don't have to have the best movement, but you have to have enough. And you could alter that. If you're not the strongest, but you could be flexible and mobile like Satyav, you're going to be strong and positioned, right? And so first thing you control is yourself, right? Second thing you can control is the mat. How do you control the mat? That's your movement, side to side, forward, back, body fakes, level change, hand fighting. That's how you control the, the board, the mat, however you want to call it. It's like chess, right? Um, the third thing you control is your attack. Right, you want to be able to use the mat to get to your attack. Once you get to your attack, then you can control your situation, right? Because every attack leads to a situation. Finally, once you're in the situation, then you can control your finish, right? And so I say, okay, well, those five things you can control in wrestling, that's life, right? So, how do you control yourself in life? It's your mind, right? And then it's also um, what you eat, drink, and breathe, right? That's how you can control yourself. Right. Then you have um, your environment right so your mat is your environment in life your environment is who you hang out with when you hang out with and where you hang out with them you may right. not be able to control the big environment right you, you right. may be like hey I, i'm in this inner city or i'm in this rural area i'm in this nice suburb right like it doesn't matter you can't control that sometimes because you're with your family but you could pick the people in that environment that align with your goals in life and that are going to make you a better person right so who when and where are you hanging out with those people, right? And so now you're, you're not, instead of controlling your attacks in life, your actions are your time. What are you spending your time on, right? Because what you spend your time on is what, you're, what, you, what you reap, right? You're, what you, yeah, you reap what you sow. So what you spend your time on is what you get back, right? And, and so 
you know, are you spending your time doing your homework? Are you spending your time reading? Are you spending your time doing spiritual stuff? Are you spending your time, enough time sleeping, right? And so you have only so many time, right? Your actions are your habits. It's what you spend your time on throughout the day. It's building the good habits. It's automating the things that are that are easy to automate your sleep schedule, certain things like that, what you eat, you know, you could automate certain decisions so that when you do spend time in your passion stuff like wrestling or music or art, now you're using decisions on things that are actually helping you advance your life. And then finally, then you have your situation, right? And this is where people are like, well, you can't always control your situation, right? But your past <laughs> actions have led you to your current situation. But to me, being able to control your situation is being able to be present. You get off your smartphone. Don't think about the past because the past is the past. There's certain times to think about the past, but sometimes you have to be here. Don't think about what's going on in the future, right? Because if you're thinking about the future, you're taking away from the moment here, right? Like one of the girls, the, she's, I think, 11. You know, she, she, we were going up the mountain for the scavenger hunt just to make it fun. And, you know, they were going to have s'mores on the top. And, but they had to go find the stuff. And she's so worried about the person who's not there to start. I'm like, but you're taking away from me and the other two people that are with you right now. So focus on this. Those people aren't here, right? We can't control that. And so being present and being in the moment, and that's why I love yoga so much is because it teaches you to just breathe, shut your mouth, and just listen to the instructions that are told. And if you could do that, you are in the moment. Because if you leave that moment, you're not following the instructions. You're not focusing on your breathing. And so just be present, be in the moment. And then finally, the last thing is in wrestling, you control the finish. But in life, you control your story. And your story is where you want to start, right? Because if you don't start with your story of who you want to be and what you want to be, and you're never going to change yourself to be a better person. You're never going to change the people and the environment. You're never going to change your actions and, and you're also not going to be able to understand how to be in the moment. And so it always starts with the end of who you want to be, right? And so what I say is be the lead, be the hero, right? Because you don't want to be so something in somebody else's story, right? So be the lead in your own story. So be your person, be the hero, right? Because you could, you could be the, the hero and then do it all, right? And so be the lead, be the hero, do it all. And if you could accomplish those things in life, that's how wrestling and life mix to me. And that's how you just take the bull by the horn and do whatever you want to do. Yeah, and being in the present moment, and we, de we dedicate a full six lessons exclusively to staying in the present moment. And our, our little jingle there is the past is history, the future is a mystery, the present's a gift, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? And, and that, how you said about focusing, um, you, kind of, you nailed it there when we talk about predator mindset versus prey mindset. All we're really saying there is focus on what you can control. Right. Uh, front like to hunt, right? So that's in your direct control. And eyes on the side like to hide. Forget about what you can't control because it's going on around you. Like the, the, the girl who was thinking about who wasn't there as opposed right. to who was there. So that's, yeah, the simple way of getting that to stick. We always say that eyes on the front like to hunt, eyes on the side like to hide. And yeah, you control your controllables. Forget about the ones you can. But it's, it's amazing how so many people get caught up in, statistics rankings records and i get it like if you're if you're doing a spartan run maybe you're, you're trying to get a certain time or you're trying to place somewhere but you can't think about where you want to place or your time you got to stay in the moment and do this task and then this and you know right in the in the moment so it's it's critical and like you said focusing on who you need to be as a person as opposed to just what you want to have the the, the analogy or the word we use there is behave Right. So the word behave is broken up into two words, be and have. And most yeah. people focus on what they want to have. And if they have it backwards, they're putting the have before the be. You need to put the be before the have. Who do you have to be to have those goals? No, that's a great way. to. I've not, I haven't heard that, but that's an amazing way to put it. It's 100 percent true, right? Yeah. We're saying the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just different language. But, yeah, it is the same things. Right. And yeah. uh you know, and, and uh, you know, you know it, whatever it is, you have to have that formula, right? And that's what I, that's what I like to tell the kids all the time. Like, you know, you, you look at the studies of the, you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, the one underlying factor is they all have a morning routine, right? But they're all going to be different because everybody's a different human being. Yeah. 
Yeah. But but the fact is that they have a routine that they know if I do this X, I will be able to produce Y after I'm done. Right. right? And so and so that what that habit is is up to you. Right. But you have to know, hey, this is gets me the most productive. And if it's not, then you have to say, look, I'm not going to eat the pound of bacon today because I'm going to feel like garbage when yeah. I'm done. Right. Like, so if you, something makes you feel bad or something that hinders your production, then you have to chop that out, replace it with another habit. And right. now you can just alter to be like, hey, if I want to produce, it's numbers. It's a numbers game. Right. There's no right or wrong. There's what works and what doesn't. Right. But that's different per person. Yeah, absolutely. There's always that human individual component. But like you said, it's a, you're, you're trying to train the average, but then dealing with the individuals on the more exceptional case. Right. Now, now I was I was curious about the workouts. I started drifting thinking about that. Is this some of the stuff that maybe some of the stuff you picked up from the Russians? Because didn't you spend a lot of time over there? It is. Yeah. So it's it's everything that I picked up from them. And so when I when I went there and I picked it up, and I brought it back, I broke it down. And that's when, you know, my uh, business partner was like, hey, this is what you guys do every day. So he broke it down and said, you guys do battles every day, right? So the battles in wrestling are live attack, live situation and a match. And so we did battles every day. And then he goes, well, then you also work on athletics. You have your athletic warm up, and then you have a circuit at the end, right? He goes, then you have skill, right? You guys did a drill in the beginning like a directional based drill. And then at the end of practice, you work more on controlling and sparring, right? And so to me, technique is broken down between direction and control. So direction of attack, control, direction to finish, right? So that's your attack, your situation, and then the finish. And then the exercise was the actual program. So like month one, you're working your oxidative system, then you're working your glycogen system, then you're working your phosphagen system, the peak. And so you, you go through the whole program, that's your exercise. Every day you go athletic warm-up, skill-based drill, live battles, attack, situation, match. Then you have uh, skill-based control sparring. Then you have athletic uh, wrestling at the, or athletic circuit at the end. And so that is what I came up with. And then I broke that down and said we could do that for a kid's class. I said, that is the method, right? Yeah. Because... That's how, that's the structure of the training. But then what you want to get better at in wrestling, it's those five things, yourself, you're in, controlling your environment, controlling your attacks. What are your attacks? Controlling the situation. So knowing all the situations. And so for us, the situations in wrestling are uh, single leg. So we have high, medium, side, single, extended, high crotch. We have high, high crotch, medium, extended, crackdown. Then we have failed attacks. Um, and I love to use the word fail, right? We have failed attacks um, and failed attacks is what I teach first, because if I could teach somebody to be the best person in a front headlock, well, there's no excuse for them to not shoot because if they don't get the leg, yeah. they, they could just get back up to their feet, right? So if you could eliminate, if you could teach them how to fail and eliminate failure, the only thing that's left is for them to succeed. Yeah, you're bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so we have three levels of failed attacks, which is front headlock, seat belt, and then 50-50 position, so like far ankle, near ankle, high crotch, high crotch. And then we do an upper body attack. We have three levels there. So we have overhook, underhook on one side. Then we have double over under, under, which is just normal over under, right? Chest to chest. And then we have two on one. And those are the upper body positions we do. And then we have top bottom. And so we have legs, legs in on base. And then we have legs in flat. And then we have controlling the wrist and the base and then controlling the wrist flat. And so from those positions, we train four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, cross train Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, cross train Saturday, off Sunday. And so if we have four day training cycles before competition, well now every day you're doing one level single. Then every day you're also doing one level high crotch. Then you're doing one level of the failed. Then you're doing one level of the upper body and then one level of the top bottom. And so you're building complete wrestlers, right? And so every day you're exposing them to one position that is one of the most important positions in the sport of wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, I was, we have some, we have a pro, an exercise dedicated to the, we, you go through the common situations, a lot like what you said, as you're saying, I'm thinking like, yep, it's like this we have on top, this we have on bottom. And of course you named a few other ones that, that'd be great to add to that list. But there it's like a lot of athletes don't even know, a lot of wrestlers don't know what they're gonna do in those situations, even as 
what do I do? Much less even felt the situation. Focus not on a control, but just getting into the direction. So you start with control, then you have control and direction, and now you're working all on direction. And so now you're eliminating all hesitation. And so you're always going to act and react faster than you can think. And so as you do that through the cycle of the training camp, now you're becoming the most complete wrestler because you're super good at control from the beginning. And now you know every direction that you can go in. And, you know, defensively, every direction that guy could go in from every position. Yeah. And so that's yeah. it, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's right. <laughs> now, is, that, is that the way? No, that's great. And it, so is that normally the way they, they train in Russia or similar to that? Yes, yeah, very and, similar. And that's across the country. That includes like Dagestan and different, because I know to say, to just say Russian, it's like it's a big country. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, every wrestling room in Ru the Russian uh, system uses this whole model. So it's so it's more more standardized than I guess how America is. I don't, I don't know. Super standardized, right? And, and that's a great thing that you said that is because I believe that this system is a standardized system. And so, like when people think of standardized in the U.S., you say, okay, well, Henry Ford standardized production, right? And so he created the assembly line, right? And so every single Model T came out the exact same, yeah. right? You just change paint at the end, and you know, one's black, one's white, whatever. Right. Um, and so you have a very similar product. Well, this system, because so it's order and chaos, right? Order and chaos is, um, to me, control and direction, right? Control is order. Chaos is direction because there's so many directions, right? And so if you, and as we alter, so as we do the situations, we're altering those every day, right? But there's a method to the madness because right. you're, you're still doing a single, but you're altering levels. You're still doing a high spot. And so that changes it up, right? So people, different wrestlers are going to pick up different things and gravitate to different areas. And so that way, this is a standardized system, but it actually increases creativity, that's, right? So, that sounds and, a lot, to me, that sounds a lot like West Side Barbell. I was over there twice, the conjugate method that Louis Simmons uses. And it's a Soviet method where it's basically, they're changing the exercise all the time so they don't adapt. So their body doesn't adapt to the loads that are being placed on them, but they're still doing. There's a there's a method to. The method to the chaos. Right. Not just doing anything. Anything, but it it's they're changing it up enough where it's it's not so draining. Whereas like in America, it's like we just drill the same thing. We take down the world wall in high school. You practice this. You practice that. You practice the next, and you're like, oh, here we go again. Right. No, absolutely. You know, and and, uh, and so I do believe this incre increases creativity because you can look at it when you watch the Russians compete at the world championships, right? They could have somebody win 65 kilos that wrestles one way and then they get so like just, I mean, just look at 74 kilos, right? Like you had, you know, Sargush, who wrestled a certain way and then you had Satya and they, they were like world champs back to back or something like that, right? It's like, they could replace one person and, and put a new person in and they wrestle totally different, but they're trained in the exact same systematic approach. Right. right? But that's because you want to open that creativity to let people gravitate because they're going to have different strength, different flexibility, mobility, balance and movement. Right. So you have to use what skill set you have physically because we're all different. But once you do do that, now you are able to use what, again, use what works for you. Right. There's no right or wrong. Right. I don't want to tell somebody, no, you, that's not that's wrong. You can't do that. I'm just going to say, do it. If it works, then yes. Amazing. Great. But if it doesn't work, that's why I have to say, look, you have to look at the statistics. Every time you do this, you're getting beat. Right. Yeah. And so now it's like, hey, if you're getting beat, figure out a different way to do it. Right. It's what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, that's great stuff. The other thing I think about, did you ever see um, Michael Yesis, but Dr. Michael Yesis' book, Secrets of Russian Sports Training? I have not. Let me pull this up. I got it up here on the, on the um, shelf. But basically, he talks about essentially how the, how the Soviets were basically like 20, 30 years ahead of us still even now. This book, Secret of um, Russian Sports Training, 
originally Secret of Soviet Sports. And I mean, he talks a lot about, it, it's just so broken down. In the book, he talks about how like in America, we have a lot of talent because we have so, we have so many people, diverse right. athletes, everything. Whereas there, you have to actually make an athlete. Whereas that's not as much, where he said the coaches, a lot of the coaches that he found in America, not that we don't have like good coaches, we do and everything, but it was just, it was a much more systematic approach. And when he said, what they're, what the whole Soviet model made possible, and that, that's certainly not a plug for communism or socialism, not at all, but just the fact that they were able to take those sports scientists and have them learn wrestling, gymnastics, right. track. They actually learned the mechanics. And I know my brother posted something here about um, like joint flexibility that you were doing, like the, the developing the angles of the, of the, I guess, the dynamic stretches or things like that. It's just so broken down and everything, even the nutrition in the book is so precise. Like in America, we say, um, we say, oh, it's like, well, have X amount of vitamin C, Y amount of vitamin A. And in this book, he goes into broken down. It shows all the nutrition based on, okay, well, if you're a hundred meter runner, that's a different nutritional need for vitamin A and vitamin C than a right. marathon runner. And I'm thinking about it. Like I have, a, I have a master's in exercise science. I'm like, they didn't tell us that. It was like right. standardized. And it, but it's so obvious once you see it. So it's just, I don't know, it's just real impressive to me. Yeah, if you can, after this, just uh, send me a picture of that book so yeah. I can look it up. But, um, but no, go, getting back to that, right? And so, like, and that's why we created the base movement class because we wanted, one, if you have a wrestling room, so many communities don't invest in a wrestling room. And so Jake Herbert and I were like, look, how do people invest in a wrestling room? Well, more people have to use it than wrestling. Right. And so if you could have a physical literacy class in the community, because wrestling rooms are unique, they're padded mats with padded walls. And so kids could learn how to move without getting hurt. And so if we were able to create a class that other people outside of wrestling could use. And so if you say, OK, well, eight and under specifically, if you could teach them how to be athletes, which is Russia, they called it general preparedness. Right. But we call it physical literacy. And so if you could teach people just how to move, well, now they're going to be able to pick up techniques of other sports a lot easier. But if you don't have physical literacy, so and I always use this term, right? Wrestling is a sport that you get rewarded for controlling somebody. Well, if you can't control yourself, yeah. right, you're never going to be able to control somebody else, right? So if you're physically limited, there's things you can't do. And if you, you can't do things, then you're not going to be able to control another human being, yeah. right? So yeah. there has to be a baseline physical literacy just to learn the sport of wrestling which we don't ever preach about that in the U.S., right? And so that's why we came up with that, because I want to be the one coach in America that goes against the grain, right? Most coaches, because I built all of this to eliminate me from all equations. I, didn't, I don't want to be the, the go-to for everything, right? And so what I said was, if I can use myself and say, look, like, get me out of this, and I could train other people to do what I do, then I'm like, okay, well, that's good for me right and so um sorry where was i going so so uh teaching the physical literacy um sorry i i just totally lost my mind but um but yeah i mean so yeah so physical literacy first um and to be honest you want to know where they learned how to their technique at least in wrestling where they learned it from chess oh really right? Yeah, well, because so chess, and, and so this is how they break it down. And this is what I've been doing on the Spartan Combat Channel. I've been going live and teaching the base system little chunks every day. Well, so here's how, so so this is from uh, sir, the so movie Searching for Body Fisher about Josh Whiteskin. I can't remember the book he wrote, um, but he said how he learned chess. So right in America, when kids learn chess, they learn with every piece on the board, right? And so if I learn, if I move my first piece, you move a piece, and I move a piece, there's millions of outcomes that that game can end with, right? And so when kids learn chess, they learn how to trick their opponent to win in a few moves, right? And so that's the equivalent of learning a headlock, right? Well, if the Eastern Europeans, when they learn chess, they learn with the king queen. And so they learn how to control the board with the two most important pieces. And so they learn how to control the board and what directions those pieces could move. And then they start adding pieces. And then the next important piece and adding the next important piece, right? And so when Russians learn, they learn how to control the body and then what direction to finish, right? And so then they start adding reverse. So then, well, how do you get to that control? Well, that's your attack, 
Well, then how do you get to attack? Well, that's your controlling the map, right? Well, that's the easiest part, right? And so if you have too many outcomes, that's a scientific term called combinatorial explosion, right? So if there's too many outcomes, you never are able to draw connections of why things work and don't. Well, when you get to the end, there's only so many moves you can make. And so here's what you, how you can think of it. So when Gary Kasparov played Deep Blue the first time, he beat Deep Blue. Well, they were like, well, Deep Blue could think a million moves a second. The human mind, about seven to maybe 12 or something like that, world class. So if Gary Kasparov could think maybe just say 10 moves a second because he sees them faster, well, here's what happened. Well, Gary Kasparov is such a good player. Do you think he's going to get tricked in the opening game? Right, because chess, you have opening game, middle game, end game. Well, Gary Kasparov is good enough. Deep Blue isn't going to be able to trick him in the beginning. Right, so now you move to the middle game. Well, again, Deep Blue is not going to trick him in the middle game. So now you get to the end game. This is based on how many pieces are left in the board. So now in the end game, there's only so many moves you can make. You don't have to think a million moves a second. Right. Right. And so Gary Kasparov was able to get to the end game where him and Deep Blue could only think the same amount. Right. So he doesn't have to think a million moves. He narrowed it down. He brought it, he brought the, brought it into his wheelhouse. And right. And so the reason he won was because he had past experiences. Right. So he had past game experience. So he knew what worked and what didn't work. Well, Deep Blue was had no experience. So Deep Blue lost. And so he told the programmers, Deep Blue, here's why I won. I made it to the end game because I don't have to think a million moves a second. I'm not going to get tricked in the beginning. I'm not too smart. I know that certain things are not going to work on me. So then he makes it to the end. And so, okay, well, now at the end game, and so what they did was they took all the recorded chess games ever played, right? And they record all chess games. And there's, no, there's letters and numbers, and they go A, 12, or whatever. I don't know how they record it, but that's what they do. And so now Deep Blue was programmed with all the probabilities of the greatest chess minds in the world. Well, the next time they played, he had, Deep Blue had not just one person's game experience, he had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of the best chess players in the world probability in in the end game right so then deep blue was able to win because he had better probability that if i do this move he's going to do this and i'm going to win and so then deep blue won and beat gary kasparov the next time they played and these are game these are games of 10 yeah and and, and so and so that's how the russians learned their technique was off of chess they so when i have a high single how many finishes do I have? I have a dump and a shelf, right? I could Barsgar. That's the third one. But Barsgar, if you don't get it, your hands get unlocked. And the next thing you know, your head, you get underneath your opponent. You're putting yourself under your opponent. Right. And if you don't get it, you lose that. So probability, that's not a good finish, right? So ideally, really, if I have a high single, I go dump or I go shelf. Once I shelf, then you have a couple different finishes, right? The guy turns in, you kick the leg out. But you're limited in numbers of move, right? You have A, B. Right, but if I have an inside tie and a wrist and you want to get to a finish, there's millions of outcomes. Yeah. Right. So you can never understand that. But as Americans, we always teach set up to attack to finish. Right. Right. So it's like why though? Yeah. Right? Yeah, there's gotta be yeah, it could you know it is it just seems like a logical place to start, but you have to you have to examine the whole thing, just like you're saying. Just because it might seem like things start with the setup doesn't mean that's how the mind necessarily needs to pick it up. And I can tell you with, with um, our mindset training, we don't start with goal setting with kids. Not that goal, goal setting is a logical place to start. But if I walk into a room, college team, and I say, okay, team, we're going to start with, we're going to start with goal setting. They're like, here we go. Right. You know what I mean? Like we have goals. We don't need this guy. So I go right in talking about, you know, dealing with pressure right before a match, exactly what they're thinking. Look, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're having a bad first round of the tournament. You were giving good opponents too much respect. I'm, I'm, you know, telling them all the common red flags that we know they're going to have. You're putting good opponents on a pedestal, you know, all that. You're wrestling better in practice than a match. Now you grab them as opposed to sometimes you kind of, it, it's, it, it sounds right. Start with goal setting, but you got to create that buy-in. But I get it. What you're saying there, so I've been presenting at the National Wrestling Coaches Convention. I remember seeing a coach talk about he starts all of his wrestlers practicing finishes before he learns any, they learn anything else because he wants them shooting to more comfortable territory, right? Right. 
So once once they get there, now they're comfortable as opposed to God, they get the leg and they're like, oh crap, now I got the leg. What do I do now? He wants them shooting into comfort as opposed to discomfort. So that was one of the things, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just known and unknown, right? Yeah. So like, so the the first high school kid I trained full time was Logan Massa, right? And for me to break him, I had to pull him up in front of his teammates and I had to stand up and be like, okay, you want to make the junior world team this year. Who do you have to beat? And he's like, okay, Aaron Pico. They were both at 65 kilos a while ago. And I was like, okay, you have to beat Aaron Pico. I said, why are you going to beat Aaron Pico? I'm tougher. Well, that's, that's not a real answer, right? You can't judge toughness. Okay. Um, why are you going? Cause I'm, I'm better. Well, that, that being better is not an answer. Why specifically are you going to beat him? Like, do you have a better single? Do you have better this? And he's like, he couldn't give me an answer. I said, okay, well, last week, what'd you do in practice? Well, Monday I wrestled for an hour. Anyone score on you? No, I'm better than everybody. Okay. What'd you do Tuesday? 45 minute go. Well, did anyone score on you? No. I said, okay, well, what'd you do Wednesday? 35 minute go, whatever. And they started going on and on through the week. And so I was like, well, I said, okay, well, Aaron Pico has an amazing single leg. I said, he finishes it on everybody. I said, so you're telling me you're going to make it to the finals of the junior world trials. And this whole time you have not defended one single leg. I said, so now Aaron Pico gets to your leg. Why are you going to beat him? Well, I'm tougher than him. Well, but you haven't finished. Yeah. You haven't practiced or went live from a single leg position once. Not concrete. I said, I said, so you're telling me you are going to win in a position that is unknown to you. And he's like, and then he got so frustrated. And then finally, the next day, he's like, you're right. He's like, I, I, I can't go in there being unprepared, right? And so, and, and this goes along the lines, and this is part of the reason why we do certain things in, in this base system is that people are afraid because of the unknown, right? So we're in a certain situation right now where we, the, our future is unknown because of this virus and a lot of things. Right. And so you could be afraid of the unknown or you could see opportunity unknown, but opportunity comes with knowledge. The more knowledge you have. And so now your unknown becomes less and less. Obviously there's going to be a lot of unknowns, but you, you could eliminate a lot of unknowns. Right. And so for me, what I really understood is that if you don't know certain parts of the sport, you're never going to be able to use strategies and tactics because you're always thinking of what, part of the sport you need to do. And so if you could eliminate those parts of the sport that you don't need to waste your energy on, right. then now you could use the art of war to be like, okay, you are, you do have the number one guy in the country. Well, how do you beat them with your strength? Because that's the art of war. You don't just say attack the number one guy in the country, right? Because there's two philosophies in life. There's early bird gets the worm and second mouse gets the cheese, right? So you can attack them, but if it goes wrong, now you're down and that guy's going to start piling it on. Yeah. Right. And so now you have to use strategies and tactics. But until you understand the sport fully, you can't use your mental capacity to use strategies and tactics. Right. And so that that's the, the whole reason why we're very consistent in our training is so that they do have that understanding. And another thing, part of why we do the training a certain way is that to get the most important thing is that match. Right. You wrestle a me. It's that match. You wrestle a tournament. It's that first match. And so every single day when we train, and there's different cycles because you're three weeks out, one week off, not off, but it's different. And so we have, okay, this match. And so we do our 20 minute warm up, six to eight minute drill, five minute live attack, fifth, in high school, college, 15 minute live situations. And then we get to the match, right? And so every single day, that's about 54 minutes of training to get to that one match. Well, yeah. if you go to wrestling rooms across the country, the coach is going to do a warm up on Monday. Then he's going to do a different warm up on Tuesday. Then he's going to do a different warm up on Wednesday. You're going to do different types of drill on this day, different types of drill on this day. You're going to wrestle different types of blocks on this day, different types of blocks on this day. Now you say, okay, get ready. You're wrestling the number one team in the country. Go get ready for this drill meet. How are they going to get ready? Right. Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday, or Thursday. Right. Right. So every day I train them to build this habit to get ready for this one match. They may not do 54 minutes. They may do like a 40, 45 minute warm up, yeah. but it's the same structure. They do the same warm up. They do some drilling, some live attack, some situations, some live wrestling. Now they're ready to wrestle that match. They could replicate that because they could replicate their success, right? So if you could replicate your success, you're, you're eliminating a lot of fear right off the bat, right? Because you know exactly what you have to give, 
right? So same with the tournament. You have that one because if you want to win and you don't, you're not ready for that first match, you don't get to the final, right? So you have that first match. But if you win that first match, what do you, what do you gift it? You got some momentum now behind you. No, you gifted a second match. Oh, yeah. Right? But if you don't, if you lose, you're like, ah, I'm in the consolation, right? If that's not a gift, right? That That's, you know, a sidebar, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> so so building those habits and practice is the biggest thing to eliminate that fear, right? And so then, like I said, if you could build that, then all it is is understanding everything you can control, yourself, the mat, yeah, your, your tax. But the biggest thing is learning what situations you could control and what directions you can finish. If you could master those last two, well, then you're going to be able to say, look, now I could use my strategy and tactics because if anything goes wrong, you're still prepared. Yeah. You know, you shoot that high crotch and he pushes the head in. I know how to finish a single. I know how to control right. this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fo first focus on control. Then now that I understand where I'm at, now I can get to my finish. Yeah. Right. No, that's critical. We believe the same thing. That's we have them write it all down. Like, here's the common situations. What are you doing here? Right. And then also with different adversity situations, ref makes a bad call. What do you tell yourself? You have a lead with 1.30 seconds left. What do you tell yourself? Like actually writing it out. Your opponent takes a cheap shot, does something dirty. What do you tell yourself? You got taken down first by someone you thought you were a lot better than. I mean, these are situations that mess people up all the time. It takes away years of training because they weren't prepared. The ref gave them a bad call. What did they tell themselves? The crowd no, for sure. and goes negative. They're not prepared for it. I, I think it was the 2015 Worlds in Vegas. I remember watching almost everyone that had a, that, that had a lead with one point, a lead by one point with one minute left in the match wound up losing. Now, granted, the Americans? It's, person's, it's in the other person's favor because last takedown wins. They got nothing to lose, so they're they're charging in with reckless abandon. But still, for almost every match, there was a you would lose. Are you talking Americans or every like just in general? So the matches that I've seen. Now, maybe it was just yeah, yeah. I was just watching. I don't know which matches I was watching, but most of them, if someone had a lead by one point with a minute left, that person usually lost. And and I have to think there's got to be something to it where. Mentally, what are we telling ourselves? Like, did they have a plan written out? I'm going to tell myself this with a minute left. Or a lot of times it was just shutting it down, protecting the lead. No, for sure, right? And so, and so, and so that to me, that's when we do our live attacks, right? Our live attacks is offense, defense, offense, offense, right? So every single day when we do live attacks, all it is, you get a point if you get the hands locked on the legs, right? And so when one guy's offense, one guy's defense, every single day we're, we're preparing for that situation, right? And so I use keywords, right? Offensively, it's body fake, level change, hand fight, motion, right? That's how you get to your attack, right? But every single day, you have to learn how to get to the attack when the other guy's only defense, right? You're losing by a point. You have to learn how to get past his head and hands, right? Opposite. Every single day for a minute, you are on defense holding a lead, right? So every single day, what do you tell the defensive guy? Control ties, keep him off balance, right? So keeping off balance, he can't set his feet, he can't shoot, right? Or control ties. If they can't clear an underhook or clear a two-on-one, they can't get to your leg, right? So every single day, you learn how to build the lead. Then you have offense, offense. It's tied at the end of the match. And that's attack, counterattack. So now it's attack, counterattack. Both guys are going. You learn how to down block. You learn how to attack, counterattack. You learn how to attack, get to the leg. And so every single day we do those live attacks to prepare for that situation, right? And so here's where it comes to the two philosophies on life, right? So here's what you have to think about when you're working in a match, right? So you're in a match. Well, what is – you're not always attacking because if you're always attacking, they're not good attacks, right? It's just high volume, right? right? You're not actually getting a real position, right? So in between attacks, where's your mindset? Well, your mindset is this. Am I losing? Then I got to be the attacker. If I'm winning, I'm the second mouth, right? So I could do certain things to bait that guy or girl into doing something. Now I'm counterattacking, right? And that's how the best Europeans, best, most specifically best Russians, look at it, right? If they're in the middle of the match, right, and they're just controlling the environment, so they're moving, they're hand fighting, they're circling, they're pushing you around. They're using that time to be like, I am the second mouse, right? Like I'm moving them, I'm body faking, I'm getting them to think because I know they're coming. So if you know your opponent has to attack you, it's easier to bait them into doing something. 
you set out a little trap, boom, they get their leg back, they're going to spin behind them, yeah. right? And so it is the time in between the attacks is that is where your mind has to go. Am I the attacker, the early bird, or am I the second mouse? Am I baiting them into a trap? And so that, that is what you have to think of when you're controlling the environment. And that has to be trained every single day or else you're never going to understand it. You don't want to be winning by a point and never training that and being in the finals of the States and being like, wow, I never trained this. I hope I could hold this lead. Right. That's got to be something that was going on. It's like this should have been addressed a while ago and on a consistent basis, like you said. Oh, absolutely. Right. It has to be done every day. Right. Because because you start learning what works and what doesn't work. Right. No, it's, that's great stuff. No, it's a ton of great information. And I hope everyone watching and I hope people to watch after this, that they just you really they should be, everyone should be sitting there with a notebook, pencil, you know, just write it all down because just a load of great information. That's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's yeah. been fun building this program. And, thank, thank you. you know, I'm, and, um, yeah. Anything you want to do, like I said, now there's more time, so it just creates more opportunities. So we're doing a lot of, you know, meeting of the minds, talk about it, what everything. I mean, like you said, there's so many different dimensions of the sport that we could have done a program on all of them. Flexibility could have been one of them. Strength, conditioning. Oh, for sure, right. Uh, technique, mindset, nutri you know, nutrition, rest, recovery. I, going back to the book, the rest and recovery, I never saw sauna sessions broken down like this, where it was like, they're saying, okay, well, the temperature needs to be between 190 degrees and 210. The relative humidity at 15%. You sit on the first bench for three minutes, you go to the top bench for the next three minutes, bottom, the bottom bench with the leg straight out, and the third one, I'm like, what? <laughs> how much, how, yeah, what days to do it on, and yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. There's so much to it, you know? I love it. I, I wrote it all down. I have it. I lived it. That's the best part. I got to live it. <laughs> That's awesome stuff. Yeah, anytime, anytime you want to do this. Definitely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Keep doing what you do. I love it. Where Take else can people find more stuff for you from Spartan? Where, where could everyone go? Uh, well, right now we're, we're just doing um, the Spartan Facebook page for the kids, the movement classes and stuff. But uh, the whole base system is going to be on the Spartan uh, platform, Spartan Combat platform. Um, there, it's going to be um, coaches, parent, athlete education, a video library, and then uh, the curriculum for schools to use for youth, middle school, junior high, high school, and then also the movement class. And so it'll all be available this uh, next school year um, on the Spartan platform. We're going to do all the filming, all the education, and then we'll have it ready and, and uh People will get an amazing product once once it's out. Awesome stuff. Yep. If you're not growing, you're dying. Got to keep right. Exactly. <laughs> Good. So take care. Thank you. Tell Joe I said hello. Good I did. Will do. Take care.